Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India today going to start with the sixth lecture of this course on international relations and so far we have in the last five lectures we have been looking at various dimensions of the international. In the first lecture we looked at what is the international and we looked at the long journey that the international has made uh, from the time it was set up as an academic department in 1919. Uh, in the last three lectures we have looked at theories. Uh, we've looked at realism, we've looked at liberalism and we've looked at feminism and in today's class we're going to start a theory which is completely and radically different from the first three and the reason uh, for it being so radically different is that it questions the fundamental uh, con conceptualization of the IR as, uh, as one with which involving states. So this, uh, today we're going to look at Marxism and Marxism is uh, refreshingly radical in looking away from the state and its freshness and vigor uh, stays unchanged from the time uh, Marx published his text. Ironically and incidentally, it's about 201 years since uh, Marx was born. He was born in 1818 and uh, even though uh, the Soviet Union has collapsed and Several people have proclaimed the end of history. I am referring to Fukuyama's uh, declaration in 1992 at the end of the Cold War when he said that there is no ideological opposition to liberal capitalism and therefore history itself has ended. But in today's uh, class, I hope to be able to show you uh, why history has not ended and why the Marxist analysis is as pertinent is as relevant as it was 150 years ago when Marx first published his uh, texts and why um, historical materialism and other Marxist understanding of how our economy functions is more pertinent uh, than ever before. Uh, so in today's class what I am going to do first is I am going to look at a few uh, what a Marxist understanding is, what does Marxism mean. I am also going to look at uh, the claim made by Waltz, Kenneth Waltz, we looked at him uh, when we looked at realism and Martin White who belongs to the English school and both of them uh, rejected Marxist claims to uh, being a realist or uh, to being a realistic and a uh, theory of international relations. So we are going to try and see why uh, Marxism has been rejected and uh, we will also look at um, key Marxist uh, theoreticians and those would be Andre Gunder Frank, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein and uh, Robert Cox and people who have revitalized uh, Marxism within uh, international relations theory. So first things first, I am just going to uh, start off by looking at Marx and uh, we will start by uh, referring to David Harvey who is a critically renowned uh, Marxist theory, theorist in today's times and um, in his uh, book The Order of Things, Harvey begins by pointing out to the fact that Marx begins his Das Kapital by uh, discussing the commodity. Now Harvey points out that it is very interesting that the book starts with uh, the conceptualization of commodity. Uh, because it is on that conceptualization that uh, his critique of capitalism rests. Now what is a commodity and why does Marx start his uh, seminal text with that? Uh, a commodity is a object uh, or a service which is completely fungible which means it can be exchanged for something. Uh, on the market. So a commodity by definition is something which can be traded in return 
it has a fungible value and uh, the question then arises that what is, uh, why is Marx talking about a commodity and what is the context of the time that he is uh, speaking in. Uh, now, uh, because we are looking at a theory of IR um, and also because we have looked at realism, liberalism and feminism in fairly great detail, uh, it is important to remember that even though realists say that ethics has no value in politics, uh, Marxism inserts itself as a quest for individual freedom, for the dignity of individual life. And it is a quest for uh, the betterment of uh, humanity in, in that sense. So Marxism has certainly an ethical concern and this will become a little transparent as we see uh, why uh, Marx is discussing a commodity. Now the time that he is uh, in the 1840s, 1850s that he is uh, crystallizing his ideas, putting them down on paper is also a period of time of rapid industrialization. Uh, this, the face of uh, Europe has changed considerably. London has been declared to be one of the most polluted cities uh, because it's, uh, the river Thames is lined by factories on either side of its banks and pollutants, uh, the sky is filled with black smoke of these factories, of these industries which are spitting out black smoke but what is going on inside the factory is what concerns uh, Marx. Now, Marx is concerned about, is concerned with the dignity of human life and with the capacity of humans to achieve a certain end uh, and therefore one can use the word telos. Teleology is an examination of the end of one's life and therefore the word telephone comes from that as well. But it is the telos of human life that Marx is concerned with. So again, Marx has certainly a normative, uh, there is a normative underpinning to his uh, theory and he is concerned about, he is um, analyzing how industrialization has changed a major feature of how humans view work, the relationship between work and humans. Now, looking at these factories where the things are being produced, Marx uh, analyzes this as one which transforms the relationship between the individual and his work itself. For Marx, uh, the ability for an individual to work is beautiful in itself if it is a creative, transformative experience. But he doesn't see that. He sees instead workers trooping in, trooping out, uh, fatigued, uh, malnourished, with no agency over their own lives. And it is here that he puts forward his concept of alienation. And alienation is that concept which elaborates as to how a worker is distanced from the process of work. And for Marx, this is a forced, staged Process. So, what is alienation? Alienation is can be uh, defined as estrangement of a lack of uh, connect, uh, a lack of emotional connect between the worker and what he is producing. And of course, in Marx's mind, uh, an artist and a work of art, um, a sculptor who is sculpting, a carpenter who is creating an object. Uh, when you create an object, you put your life force into uh, what you are creating. And uh, for him, work uh, is a source of contentment and creativity and fulfillment. And therefore, he introduces the term alienation when he sees factory workers working but with no zeal, no zest, there is no spark in their eyes because they, th there is an alienation. So, Marx talks about a four stage process of alienation. Uh, the first is over the process. So if you are working in a factory and there is a, a process line involved, you have no agency over, over the process of how things are being produced. The second is the product. What, what you are producing, do you have a say in it? Is there, what sort of a role do you have to play? Is it a mechanical role? Uh, 
and of course Marx is concluding that there is no relationship between uh, the producer and the product. So mass uh, tins of cheese are produced in a factory but the people who are working with them uh, have no uh, bond with that. So it is the process, it is the product. The third stage, stage is the human, uh, the species essence. Now that is a German word. Uh, which uh, Marx mentions, uses, but it refers to the ability of, the hu of human beings to create. Now this is something that uh, Marx is uh, uh, preoccupied with, that uh, what are human be how are human beings different from animals? Again, that's a, that's a question that Aristotle posed as well. And um, Marx argues that we have the ability to transform, we have the ability to create, we have the ability to play chess, write poetry and that is what is our human, uh, that is what defines the essence of our species. So the third form of estrangement is the alienation from being a, the human that you are and the fourth and most damaging, uh, the most severe form of alienation is the alienation with yourself. So you are alienated from uh, the own, your own self and that is the estrangement that uh, Marx is referring to. Now in Marx's analysis, uh, it is the creation of the proletariat class and the bourgeoisie and the struggle against them where violence is the way forward for this class to transform this. So looking at his analysis of um, workers alienation, Marx builds it up to, uh, to argue that it is only when a class identifies itself consciously as a class and revolts and rebels and transforms the structure is when liberation is possible. And therefore we stop here at two essential points just to mull over them before we move on. The first is that Marx is the transformative actor over here is not the state, it is a class, a class is bound by its economic interest, it is defined economically and over here Marx is positioning two forms of uh, two, two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The proletariat is the conscious worker class which is going to struggle against it. That is the first point. The second point is the role of violence is itself. Uh, Marx imagines uh, violence as a form of transformation. It is violence is for the better and therefore class struggle is upheld as that way of historical materialism where you can move forward only by uh, changing the circumstances and of course to quote the famous quotation of um, Marx where he says that men are born into uh, a certain world but the point is to change it and uh, Marx's theory is clearly uh, Marx's theory is clearly driven to uh, change circumstances and uh, look at the world not following the state analysis but by a class analysis. Uh, looking at Marx's theory however, one is also reminded of the fact that it is not, uh, it is hard to then make this compatible to international relations which is driven by units of states. Uh, international relations is defined by relations between states and non-state actors. But is a class a non-state actor? At the 1881 uh, uh, International uh, Union for Workers, the slogan was workers of the world unite. And therefore it is interesting then to ask the question whether Marxism itself is suitable for um, for its application for IR at all. Now the answer to that question is lies in the word commodity. What do we consider a commodity? And uh, a commodity can be both a service as well as an object. Now just two examples uh, of that. Uh, the first is the concept of a brain strain which is that in uh, third world countries, developing countries, one finds that the most uh, professional, educated, qualified people routinely migrate uh, from first uh, third world poor developing countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka being examples, 
to first world countries like uh, uh, the USA or the UK. Now this is called the brain strain rather than the brain drain because one sees that uh, as a consequence of this migration, uh, these countries do not uh, have the uh, these professional uh, qualified people do not return, do not stay in their home, uh, in their home rather they move away. If that is not an uh, example enough to highlight as to what qualifies as a commodity, services or goods, uh, another example would be the fact that uh, our bodies are now seen being seen as commodities as well. So there is a recent book uh, called uh, Banking on the Body which looks at as to how uh, our own bodies are becoming materials to be sold, whether it is uh, wombs, whether it is semen, not just reproductive organs, but a wide array of things now qualify as commodity, which commodities which are sold across borders. So whether it is a doctor who has migrated to the UK or whether it is a um, a uh, Malayali uh, uh, ma manual worker working in the Middle East, we do see that services and objects are f moving across the world and there clearly is a global economy which is part, which is, uh, part of this commodification of everything from bodies to services to uh, telebanking to things which are intangible to those which are tangible and therefore one is persistent with the idea that Marxism indeed is relevant pri precisely because one sees an in intensive commodification of things which were previously not even considered commodities. Again the uh, example being a genetic data or a womb or other bodily uh, uh, organs. So, looking at the Marxist analysis, one isn't uh, one isn't um, one cannot help but be persuaded by the power and potency of his argument that there is a in a undeniable dimension of commodification to our lives, where there is a sense of estrangement of the worker and what he is producing and there is a certain uh, alienation between the lives that we lead and the control we wield over uh, how we express our humans essence or what Marx or a better word for that would be our creativity or our productivity. Now uh, in 1917 we do know that uh, there was uh, 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 Lenin and his comrades uh, organized an armed struggle and the Tsar uh, of Russia was uh, overthrown and there began the experiment and foundations of the first, the world's first uh, communist state. Uh, in 1924, this was formalized as the USSR, the United Socialist uh, so uh, Sovereign Republics uh, USSR and uh, clearly then it, it was demonstrated that far from Marx's ideas of the disappearance of the state because that is what he anticipated because the state was that oppressive apparatus, it was quite the opposite and as soon as uh, diplomats were appointed by the USSR, it became very clear that uh, far from being a global transformation, communism would then be a uh, uh, a communist state would conform to other ideals of what a state would be, which is that it would have clearly defined boundaries, it would um, have, have a foreign policy, it would have a ministry of external affairs and conduct its foreign policy pretty much like all other states do. It is also during this time that there emerges the Frankfurt School with Adorno and Horkheimer who try to retrieve Marxism, uh, they are clearly disillusioned by the state set up by uh, Lenin and then uh, Stalin and it is the uh, Frankfurt School which positions its first uh, re-examination of Marxist theory, tries to re-evaluate it 
and it is here that they put forward the idea of imminent critique. Now the term imminent critique is fundamental to Marxist analysis which is that the critique exists from within, um, is existing within the structure which is meant to transform and uh, the, although the Frankfurt School, we are not going to dwell upon them for very long, did not directly contribute to Marxist theory but they did keep the flame alive in uh, holding it up as a valuable perspective and in um, trying uh, new ways of uh, revitalizing it and uh, pulling away from the association of Marxist theory with the communist state that the USSR had begun. Now through these years, the 1930s, 40s, 50s and 60s, uh, the USSR becomes an increasingly militarized ideological opposition to the USA. It is then when the Cold War begins at the end of the Second World War. And in every way, the USSR is exactly uh, mirrors uh, the USA in trying to be a hegemonic great power in asserting itself. Uh, and at the same time, it also helps a uh, newly developing country. So it also seeks out uh, post-colonial states, tries to form allies like almost everybody else. So, so far we have looked at as to how Marxist theory was very different from it in practice. But the two points that we need to uphold and remember or remind ourselves of is that number one, uh, Marxism has, has had a certain egalitarian ethos in mind when he was writing about it, about a, a form of liberation from oppressive uh, capitalistic structures, which of course is applicable even today. And the second is that violence was seen as a legitimate form of overthrowing uh, the uh, prevailing dominant uh, bourgeoisie class. Now interestingly, it is in the 1970s that uh, we see that three uh, 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 reams of theories unravel uh, side by side. We have looked at how in 1979, Waltz publishes his theory of international politics. This is also the period where uh, Robert Keohane and Joseph Nye are talking about interdependence. And it is also this period which uh, introduces Marxist conceptualization in IR theory. And we are going to be looking at these three scholars. Uh, the first is Andre Gunder Frank, uh, the second is Emmanuel Wallerstein and the third is Robert Cox. And what is interesting is that all three of them uh, draw upon uh, Marxist analysis, uh, they draw upon uh, an understanding of international politics where they are not looking at states and instead looking at the global political economy. So all three of them are moving away from the state uh, while liberalism and uh, realism are focused on the state all three of them shift their focuses away and look at the world as a global uh, economy which is interlinked, it is enmeshed and it is, uh, it is representing a, a certain order, it is representing a certain uh, nature and that, is, that nature is what they intend to reveal. But before we get to see what they have to say, just a little bit about the context, the 1970s and uh, in the lecture on liberalism and neoliberalism, we looked at this concept of interdependence. Now the neoliberals are positioning uh, trade, international trade, free trade as a, a panacea for war and the reason why they are doing that is that by the end of the Second World War, uh, three extremely important institutions have been set up. And these are the, uh, the IMF, the World Bank and the GATT. And all three of them have a distinct neoliberal uh, character, which is that they hope to pull down straight, uh, state barriers to trade and promote uh, trade across boundaries 
and uh, they are championing an anti-protectionist state which means that they do not want states to control the economy which is what we call a protectionist economy. Instead, they are championing and pushing for states to reduce their uh, trade barriers. So, free trade can only be possible when there are no trade barriers. So, when we imagine free trade, we need to imagine it a state with walls around it and those are those trade barriers which do not allow goods and services. So, when we mean services, we mean people providing those services. It could be a hairdresser, it could be a waiter, but a service is a intangible commodity provided by a person from a massage to a, a cup of tea made uh, by somebody in the kitchen. So, all these are intangible. So, goods and services means the flow of people and objects across the boundary. So, when we imagine trade barriers, imagine it as a state with boundaries with very high walls around them and when free trade, uh, the champions of free trade would like those walls to be lowered in order for this trade to be facilitated and that is what is called a tariff. A tariff is a tax, particular tax put on uh, goods being traded across the bound, uh, across the border. So, what is interesting is that by in the 1970s, the whole world is enmeshed and by enmeshed we mean they are being pulled together by these, uh, by these forces of neoliberalism where states are signing up to be member states of the IMF, the World Bank and GATT. Of course, the negotiations for GATT are going on, ongoing at this period of time. But the IMF and the World Bank play an insidious role in luring states into this net. And why do I use such strong words such as insidious and luring is because the IMF and the World Bank promise assure economic security and in exchange they barter a state's uh, control over its economy. So, if a state is to get a loan from any of these uh, any of these agencies for development and social projects, it would have to therefore reduce its control over the bound over its uh, over its uh, economy. So, what happens by the 1970s is that across the world, uh, developing countries and developed countries are enmeshed in this international structure, international state of uh, classes across the boundary and it is here that Andre Gunder Frank speaks of his dependency theory. Now, dependency theory emerged from uh, Latin America where uh, the question was the question being raised was the progress and development of developing countries who were part of this international political economy. And it is here that Frank comes up with incisive conceptualizations which allow us to see the economy differently. So, where realists see states, uh, Frank argues that the whole international political economy can be divided on the basis of what he calls center and periphery. And by center and periphery, he means that in all in the uh, existing theories, both liberalism and realism, there is no mention of production. Where is production taking place? Again, returning to the Marxist question, who is producing what? Uh, what control does one have over what is being produced? And Frank pointed out that there is a distinct, uh, there is a distinction between what is produced in third world countries, developing countries and first world countries and he argued that in terms of manufacturing, uh, first world countries uh, are where things are being assembled but it is in the third world countries where cheap labor is used to produce things which are then uh, exported to uh, these first world countries. So, just a simple example of that would be the iPhone. The iPhone is um, the 
the intellectual property rights lie with Macintosh or Steve Jobs and the design and the layout and the intricacies which go into it are wholly American uh, in California, America. But in terms of its production, it is uh, Macintosh products are produced in China and that's a classic example as to how globally there is a division of labor where developing countries uh, use cheap labor to produce finished goods which have been designed and conceptualized. So, there is almost an intellectual and material uh, division to this intellectual uh, to this international division of labor which means that the intellectual aspects of creation come from the first world. So, the finest machines are designed and conceived of in Germany, France, uh, of course, I am generalizing very broadly and America, but they are executed in darkly lit rooms with uh, in Bangladesh in uh, poor countries uh, where they are produced and uh, then sent back, uh, then sent to these first world countries to be sold. So, Frank argues that globally there is a distinction between the center and the periphery and the center is clearly the source of power. It is the bourgeoisie capital, it is where uh, the ideas and the intellectual aspect of production is taking place and the manual aspect, the harsher side, the menial aspect of production takes place in the periphery. But that is not the most important aspect of Frank's argument. The most important aspect of his argument is his concept of underdevelopment. So, Frank argues that as a consequence of this dependence of the periphery, so periphery means something on the margin, center means something at the core. Um, as a consequence of the dependency of the periphery on the center, Developing countries are underdeveloped, which means that they will perhaps never be able to be self-sufficient and have uh, constructive economies because they will constantly be dependent on ev on every way on the on these uh, on the center of this uh, international capitalistic structure. So Frank's argument uh, highlights as to how class. Uh, can run across the international political economy and as to how in many ways the Marxist analysis is uh, relevant, uh, pertinent today and in, at a time when national boundaries are being upheld at the same time. So, what one sees is that class is relevant in spite of uh, national boundaries and uh, Gundar Frank and Emmanuel Wallerstein. Uh, who is also uh, aligned with the dependency theorist, uh, highlight very clearly as to how class is a relevant category in the analysis of uh, international politics. The utility of Frank's argument lay in drawing the world's attention to the great inequalities between uh, rich and poor countries. Uh, this was also the time when the newly uh, liberated countries were rallying around the, the non-alignment movement. Uh, there was also a call for a new international economic order, NIEO, uh, made by them in 1974. So, uh, Frank's intervention via uh, dependency theory uh, revitalized the question of uh, global poverty, uh, hunger, um, starvation, malnourishment, social issues uh, at the global level which had been evaded so far uh, by the mainstream theories. Uh, similarly, Emmanuel Wallerstein, uh, also a dependency theorist, looks at the world's systems and he argues that at each epoch there has been a different system. But again, uh, like Frank, uh, Wallerstein draws our attention to uh, what concerns our lives uh, every day and that is production. Who is producing uh, what and for whom and why are questions which uh, 
deal with our day-to-day -day lives and uh, Franks and Emmanuel Wallerstein's interventions uh, certainly firstly uh, demonstrated the inability of liberalism and uh, realism to engage with questions of morality but more importantly it revitalized a uh, Marxist uh, understanding building upon Marxist uh, understanding of um, the capitalistic uh, structure now we come to the third um, an uh, extremely influential theorist who used uh, Marxist categories and co concepts in his 1981 uh, book and the author I'm referring to is Robert Cox uh, Robert Cox's book uh, on international relations, uh, the uh, social, social forces and world orders, published in 1981, was a key text which uh, built upon Marxist theory. I did that, but more importantly, it challenged the insights provided by realism and liberalism. And we start by looking at Cox's famous uh, statement uh, when he argues that um, theory is always uh, for some purpose. It is by someone and for some purpose and thereby drawing the theorist into the debate as much as the theory itself. Now, Robert Cox uh, was, is a Canadian theorist. He worked in the International Labour Organization in the early part of his career and perhaps that influenced his uh, thinking along these lines because uh, Cox, Cox positions uh, production as a key area for international politics and we will see that in a little bit but first the, uh, we look at how he challenges or critiques uh, realism and uh, liberalism. Uh, Cox starts off by reminding us that every theorist comes from a certain vantage point. He is writing in a certain time, space and location and it is important to identify that when you are reading uh, a text or a book or a theory. Uh, he divides theories into two parts. The first is a problem solving theory and the second is a critical theory. Now within problem solving theories he puts uh, realism and liberalism because he argues that both these theories are the most crucial uh, valuable part of uh, Frank's theory was uh, the fact that he out he outlined uh, global inequalities of hunger of um, poverty of uh, inaccess to uh, basic resources. Frank's argument that the world is structured around the center and periphery uh, highlighted that the question of rich and poor countries is not just a question of choice, but it has a certain historical background to it. So when we look at these Marxist theorists, what they were doing is of crucial, of vital importance is that they were historicizing IR and there was a certain poverty of history when we look at realism and liberalism, neither of them look at the ugliness of for instance colonialism, neither of them looks at the history, the violent history of capitalism. Uh, both of them have a very uh, convenient way of looking at uh, what order and um, uh, what is acceptable within international politics is. So in many ways uh, Frank and Emmanuel Wallerstein uh, were drawing the attention of um, scholars, of students around the world to the fact that we cannot escape from history and the political context of this time supported that which is that um, this is also the time when newly, develop, uh, newly uh, liberated countries were aligning themselves under the non-alignment movement as a form of a foreign policy. We know about uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Abdul Nasser, Abdul Nasser of Egypt, uh, Tito of Yugoslavia who were trying to uh, shape their, stake their future uh, as being distinct from being aligned with these great powers. 
but what uh, Frank and Wallerstein was saying quite um, bleakly and uh, as a um, reminder of the futility of these attempts was that irrespective of non-alignment movement, economically there is a international class division of the poor uh, lowly paid migrant worker in South Asia, Africa and South America and it's their dependence on the material, on the manufacturing setup which comes from uh, the West, from the developed world. So during that period this, uh, this was highlighted as the North-South division because if one looks on at the map and one looks at the equator which cleanly divides the world into two, uh, the north countries are north of the equator, the majority of them and the majority of developing countries are south of the equator. So this politics ha was called for as just for the sake of simplicity as a no north-south politics but uh, what Frank and Wallerstein were doing was to uh, draw the attention of the product of these countries to their long histories of colonization, of decolonization and the cost of that on their national economies, on their people, on their psychology, on their future. And, um, before we look at Robert Cox, just to look, just to sum up what we've done so far is that we've looked at as to how Marx's preoccupation was with commodity, the production of a commodity, productive forces, uh, who controls uh, what is to pr be produced and uh, under what circumstances and essentially his was a quest for uh, returning um, humans, not man, returning humans to their, to the nature, to that point where they had a sense of agency and control over what they produce. And of course, we see that at the, in the world right now, uh, there are forces beyond our control. And uh, we will be discussing this when we see globalization as well as to how globalizing forces are often seen as neutral forces. But of course, they shape and influence our world in uh, many different ways. So what Marx, uh, Marx and Marxist theoreticians in IR are constantly drawing our attention to is production. Uh, where does production take place? What is the site of production? What is the relationship between the worker and the owner of the warehouse, the factory? And, eventually, and lastly, uh, what is the scope of liberation within that? Is a salary liberation or is liberation greater than that? And when we look at uh, lowly paid uh, uh, migrant workers working in sweatshops, working, uh, producing, and, uh, uh, ma producing things on a mass line, it only highlights that uh, production is indeed that issue which is not spoken about uh, when we look at IR and it is something which Robert Cox uh, takes upon in his 1981 book uh, The so uh, Social Forces and World Orders and the Theory of IR. Now this is a, a powerful book uh, published in 1981 and uh, Cox is a Canadian uh, theorist who worked in his early years in the International Labour Organization and uh, as a theorist has been very influential in not only bringing Marxist analysis into IR uh, but also uh, outlining the limitations of liberalism and uh, uh, realism. So let's see how he does that. Uh, Cox begins his book by saying that theory is always for someone and for some purpose. Now, this is a famous uh, sentence now. It's a famous sentence because it is the most useful way of questioning uh, where an author and a text come from. Uh, like we looked at in the second uh, lecture, uh, when we read a book, when we look at a text, a poem, 
uh, it's not just the text uh, that we must see, we must also see the author, the invisible author, we must visibilize the invisible author in order to see the context, the space, the time, the location of that author because those are crucial elements of understanding a text and Cox does just that. So he looks at realism and he looks at other theories and he says that theories can be divided into two kinds. The first is a problem solving theory and the second is a critical theory. A problem solving theory is classically sophisticated and here Cox says that the more sophisticated a uh, theory is the more invisible are the inherent hierarchies upon which it is built and of course he is referring to Waltz's celebrated uh, text of 1979 published two years prior to his book A Theory of International Politics which was celebrated for being elegant for parsimonious and he outlines a few features of problem solving theories. The first is that problem solving theories try and describe reality and are part of the global uh, unequal structure which means that problem solving theorists are not trying to change anything but they are pretty much part of that structure which allows them to write in a certain way and over here of course uh, Cox is pointing to the deep uh, relationship between institutions, material capabilities and ideas which means the richer uh, institution, uh, the more seriously it is taken, the more easily it is able to fund projects and therefore the visibility of those ideas are quickly translated into books. So Cox is referring to the ease with which realists have published, have persuaded people. So the first thing is that he says is that uh, uh, the there is a, prob a problem solving theorists do not try to change the world because they are part of that structure and they are beneficiaries to it. The second is that they are ahistorical. They do not deal with history and both liberalism and realism do not deal with history because it is too uh, ugly to bear, uh, it is too ugly for the United States to bear uh, and accept the terrible uh, chapters in its history when it comes to slavery, when it comes to colonization, uh, when it comes to brute violence and liberalism couches all of that in sophisticated terms. Similarly, realism is remarkably ahistorical. Uh, Waltz talks about states but he does not look at a uh, history prior to the first world war and again the, the C word colonization, neither of them engage with colonization. So Cox is telling us that certain theories uphold the world order, they uphold violence, they uphold injustice, they uphold inequality because they are part of that structure and in many ways problem solving theories are status quo, so they do not want to change. Uh, the way the world is. In comparison, Cox argues that there is critical theory and critical theory is that theory which steps away from the world order and again to remind us, to remind ourselves what Marx says, uh, the point of the, um, the point of the world is to change it. We see the world in a certain way but the point however is to change it and critical theory takes that upon itself. And it does that by distancing itself from, uh, rea from uh, global realities and asking the question as to how it can be changed. Now Cox, it is here that Cox brings in the, the uh, concept of production and he outlines as to how globally and historically production has been a part of colonization and as to how rich countries are rich precisely because uh, they have reaped the benefits of colonization. So most first world countries are former uh, imperial nations, Germany, uh, Belgium, France, uh, Italy, uh, the USA have been former imperial nations and this aspect cannot be shied away from. One has to put in the historical context of change when we expect change. And therefore Cox's theory is one which is geared towards 
changing the world in a certain way and uh, it is here that Cox provides the ways in which one can counter this um, uh, the manner in which production is uh, organized and uh, hierarchized in, uh, inter in the international political economy. The, th uh, the other thing that Cox does is that he brings in uh, this term social orders. So just to remind you all when we looked at uh, realism uh, and we were looking at Waltz's theory of um, Walter's theory and we looked at uh, the relationship between the structure and the units. Uh, Waltz uses this word that states are socialized into being uh, uh, into accepting anarchy and making survival their first principle. So he does use that word socialized which means that states are social actors they do learn and anything which is social is capable of changing. But beyond that, Waltz does not say much about uh, social and socializing or the capacity of states to change. But Cox takes it on. Cox takes it on by arguing that social orders can be created and it is here that he uses the word structure and world orders in order to highlight how change can be brought about, states can change if the world order changes and perhaps the most powerful and the weakest part of his theory is his vision of the future. Now when uh, Waltz, the realist, uh, when uh, Robert Keohane, Joseph Knight, both of them are liberal scholars, are uh, positioning their theories, neither of them is championing a certain vision of the world and I think that is where uh, Marxist theorists are different because they have a certain belief that ch uh, change can be brought about, transformation is possible and Cox is uh, does champion that. He argues that there are three scenarios under which uh, change can be brought about. Uh, the first is by accepting the capitalist hegemony the world order remains the way it is. Uh, the second would be to internationalize production on certain lines where it is not hegemonic, where it is anti-hegemonic and that is a fairly um, a hopeful, idealistic uh, dream to have that production itself is organized on a global level. Uh, whereby it is not exploitative and whereby the human species is allowed to experience the species essence which Marx spoke of. And lastly, Cox talks about as to how uh, uh, developing countries can uh, break away and create a counter narrative to the narrative of uh, capitalistic uh, states. So these three scholars, uh, Frank, Wallerstein and Cox are speaking in a similar language in their concern for uh, global inequalities. Uh, when we look at the North-South uh, debate and the North-South, the politics between the North and South, we also see that there is a, a palpable difference in the quality of life when it comes to malnourishment or uh, disease. Uh, access to resources, education, uh, empowerment between North and South. So there is a moral indignation about global inequalities, about the fact that the economy, the global economy depends upon lowly paid uh, migrant workers and yet those workers do not have access to resources which they white collar counterparts would have in the developed world. So there is a moral indignation, there is a concern with social equalities, inequality, there is a concern with a global injustice which guides the work of these three Marxist scholars and they certainly revitalized uh, Marxist theory by making it compatible with uh, international relations theory and that is where their value lies. 
and uh, in the examination of the economy they are able to analyze uh, international politics with by shifting their focus away from the state having said that uh, there have been other interventions uh, using marx which have broken away from just what these three have uh, said i am referring to uh, jurgen habermas and jurgen habermas as a marxist does quite the opposite he argues that uh, marx overplayed the role of production and the role of labor and he in turn argues that uh, there have been other forces which shape humans and their ability to create and he talks about a public sphere of communication and of course several other scholars have built upon marx by uh, reworking him by redefining his work questioning parts of it building borrowing and rejecting and habermas is one of them uh in the next class we will be looking at critical theory we mentioned it briefly with the frankfurt school with adorno and horkheimer and uh, what is important to remember while we wrap this lecture up is that uh we must imagine international relations as a reflection of international politics and uh the white western hegemony was challenged by post colonial states and we see that similarly uh taking place within the realm of theory and i will see you now in the next class where we look at critical theory at greater length thank you so in our evaluation of uh marxist theory there are few things that we must uh, keep in mind the first is that or uh, production labor or uh, la or the relationship between uh, workers and what they produce is of tremendous value in this analysis when we look at the world in this way it breaks away from the confines of the nation state and it allows us to perceive relationships across uh, boundaries across the globe at a global uh, level it also allows us to see as to how ideas and uh, materiality have a deeper connect uh, and in many ways uh, ideas coming from the west uh, have a greater potency than ideas coming from uh, the south and it is exactly these um, inequalities that the marxist theorists are uh point out vigorously and persistently and consistently in their work so from the time cox published his work marxist theory has of course remained a key contender in looking uh, in analyzing the world and of course uh, ir theories are not competitive there are also overlaps with uh, other theories so there is a lot to be shared with uh marxism critical theory constructivism uh, feminism uh these are theories which are trying to change the world as we see it they are transformative uh theories and um uh, if you are interested in looking at uh works being written on marx perhaps the best place to begin would be david harvey who has looked at marx extensively and uh, one can sum up by saying that a uh, marxist theory is certainly pertinent uh, and relevant at a time when globalization is shrinking the world and is making the capitalistic nature of that globalization uh, extremely evident and uh, the clearest example of that is the other uh, is the world trade organization and we will be looking at the multiple disputes between developing and developed countries uh add greater detail in subsequent classes uh as for now we will be looking at another a set of theories critical theory in the next class and uh it is there that again the frankfurt school is uh takes on the imminent critique which is looking at the structure and critiquing it from within So in this class we've looked at Marx uh his theory uh and its application to IR which is absolutely compatible with it and absolutely necessary 
and is a transformative uh, theory at core uh, looking at violent uh, class struggle as a way of transformation. None of this is without its complexities or uh, questions, but that would be for another class at another time. Uh, thank you for now.